ministry, and uh, you know that my heart is heavy this morning, uh, has been since last August when I found out that they moved our annual AMCT, our Advanced Missionary Chaplain training, from August when we've been having it until June, the week of your camp meeting. And uh, when I found out about it, I, I cried and called Brother Freeman, I think he cried with me for a while, and, and uh, so we're, we're going to miss you all. This camp meeting. Camp meeting has just been, it's been more like a revival for me. It really has, I'll just be honest with you, the last few years. And so um, let me encourage you with the lineup that you have coming. Be faithful. Try to be at every try to be at the morning services if you, if you can be here. I mean, what a blessing you're going to receive. And in this day and age in which we live, we need the encouragement and the help that you'll get from that meeting. Amen. 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 And uh, Amen. so uh, be faithful to your camp meeting. Sorry we won't be able to be with you this year. Be praying for us. That week is one of the most important weeks of our ministry, and it's our advanced missionary chaplain training. We have our missionaries uh, and chaplains. Uh, we'll be there with their families, many of them. And uh, it's a great time of fellowship, but it's also a very intense time of training and classroom instruction from some of the best missionaries and, and, uh, and some of our advanced chaplains. So, but Morrison teaches some of the missionary classes. I'll teach some of the chaplain classes. It's just uh, it's a great time of instruction, but it's also a great time of preaching, of chaplain's day, and fellowship. Amen. The missionaries love uh, seeing the chaplains. It's the only time they get to see them, and the chaplains love meeting with the missionaries. And so it's a great time of fellowship as well. Pray for that week, if you would, as, uh, as uh, God will bear much fruit from it. It's good to be here with you today. I was looking at this cross, and uh, was this for an Easter thing or something you had? I think so. And how, how can you look at that without giving thought? Amen. Mm -hmm. I realize the cross, like the American flag, it just had more of a. It's just a symbol. We don't worship the cross as such. We worship Him who hung on the cross. Amen. 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 But how can you not look at that cross and realize what Jesus Christ did for you and I? We say it this way. How marvelous! Marvelous is a thin word. How wonderful. We just, our human language does not have the words to describe what he did for us. That flag stands for something. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stands for something. It stands for sacrifice. Well, we've forgotten that today, haven't we? Yes. We've forgotten sacrifice. It stands for liberty. It stands for freedom of conscience. Read our forefathers' writings. It stands for a great many things that you and I love. Amen? Amen. But we don't worship the flag. It's just a symbol of the country we love. It's the same thing with the cross. We don't worship this piece of wood, but we love what it stands for, amen? amen. And, the, and the cross that Jesus died on. And I'll tell you what, I've preached in some humbling places before, but I've never preached at the foot of the cross. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting experience. You might pardon me if I get lost a couple of times, because that's pretty humbling to preach at the foot of the cross. Good place to be, amen? amen. At the foot of the cross. But uh, tell, tell Pastor Freeman I wasn't expecting to preach at the foot of the cross this morning. Amen. Amen. We want to be a blessing to you folks. You're always such a blessing to us. And uh, good to see you. It really is. We've missed you all. I know you've been in prayer for us uh, with the passing of my father in law. If you read our recent prayer letter, you know he passed away a couple of weeks ago. Pray for my wife. She has been through these last couple of years, it's been very difficult. The last six months in particular. And now her mother uh, requires 24 7 care house. I mean, literally, we're talking about a lady that I don't know how she does it. The, the, the sleep has just not existed for her the last several months. And, uh, you know, I, I like to say I help, but the truth is she does 95% of the work when it comes to taking care of her folks. And her dad passed peacefully. He's at home now. We appreciate that. Um, but you, you pray for her. Going through a very difficult time right now and spiritually is uh, still a great encouragement to me. And she wanted me to tell you all Hello, and she loves you. This is a home away from home church for her. And she knows you all love us too. So you pray for my sweet wife this morning, would you? Appreciate that. Her name is Kim, for those of you that don't know her. I celebrated a couple of weeks, 41 years. Some of you are saying, how in the world did she put up with you for 41 years? That's another one of the great mysteries of life. Amen. <laughs> I don't know either, but 
Uh, I asked her if she'd hang on for another 41 years, and she said, I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> so you pray for me that I could be on some good behavior in the coming weeks. Amen. I like to eat and sleep indoors. Amen. Can I get a witness, husbands? <laughs> pray for me to be on good behavior. I appreciate my life. Pastor asked me to, to sing. Why? I don't know, but I do love to sing. I don't claim to have a wonderful voice, but I love to sing. We're in a musical family. Uh, had one of those dads that it was an enigma to me. I mean, he, he could pick up any instrument and in just a matter of a few hours. You ever see somebody like that? He played it like he'd been playing it all his life. He bought an uh, auto harp. Don't know what an auto harp is? Hard to see it anymore. You hold it like this and you play the chords with this hand and then it's like a harp and you strum it with this hand. He bought one of those one night and I asked him what it was. He said, an auto harp. And I said, great. I said, what are you going to do with it? He said, well, I'm going to play it. I went outside, played football with my friends, came back about dark, and he was playing that thing like he'd been playing it all his life, and I was blown away. And we just, we always had music in the family, and so singing is something we, we still do in my house all the time. And don't have dad's gift, but uh, have dad's love for music, and certainly when it comes to our Savior. Pray for me, dug this old song up yesterday, and I was singing it all day long, and so I knew it's what God wanted. I haven't sung this in church in years, but I do love the words. Pay close attention, would you? <clears throat> I chose a path of sin and loss Apart from God above Until by faith I saw the cross And Jesus' look of love His wonderful look of love His wonderful look Made the teardrop start, broken one my heart. His wonderful look of love. I viewed his body on the tree and searched his thorn crowned brow. It seemed he spoke from Calvary. For thee I'm dying now. His wonderful look of love. His wonderful look of love. Made the teardrop start. Broken one my heart. His wonderful look of love. I could not spurn. His love divine and careless turn away. He saved this guilty soul of mine. Now I am his today. His wonderful look of love. His wonderful look of love. May the teardrop start. Broken one, my heart, his wonderful look of love. Aren't you glad for Calvary this morning? Amen. 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 Open your Bibles if you went to the Gospel of John, chapter number five. Gospel of John, chapter number five. <laughs> Your pastor wouldn't be here, so I thought I'd turn to his gospel this morning. Some of you hadn't smiled yet. I'm kind of wondering what's going on. John chapter 5. I was talking with a gospel singing group. I was preaching in North Carolina. I've not heard these folks before. Fine gospel singing group. It was a family. And they had seven or eight kids, but they were not younger. They were like teenagers on into college age. Very good gospel singing group. And we had a little fellowship afterwards, and I started cutting up with the, the teenagers and the, and the college kids, as I've been known to do from time to time. And we were having a good time, and we just we got to talk about the Bible somehow. And I love it when the, when the conversation gets around the Word of God. And, yeah. and, and what they were just at, we were just asking each other fun questions. And one of them asked me, he said, uh, who, who's your favorite Old Testament character? And I thought for a minute, I said, well, I, I suppose David. And they said, well, that's because he was a military man and you're in the military ministry. I said, well, that, that could be part of it. I said, the real reason to me that David's my favorite Old Testament character is because nobody worshiped like David. 
read the Psalms. In fact, I'll su submit to you, you want to have to learn how to worship Christian? Read the Psalms. Nobody worshiped like David. Amen? And they asked me, they said, now who's your favorite New Testament character? And I didn't have to think very long about this one. I said it was the Apostle John. And they said, well, well, why John? And I said, same reason as David. Nobody walked closer with Jesus Christ than John. Wasn't he the one that was leaning on Jesus' breast at that supper? Wasn't he the one that the Bible says, the, the one, the disciple whom Jesus loved? I don't know about you, but I want to be in that category, amen? And I love John. I love his writings, and I certainly love his gospel. One of my 66 favorite books in the Bible, amen? I pray it's one of yours, too. In John chapter number 5, and I'll confess to you, this first came to me on May the 19th. The reason I remember that so well is because it was the day we buried my father-in-law, who was such a tremendous influence on me, particularly as a young Christian. His testimony of faithfulness, integrity, and giving, I'll never forget how blessed I was to have a father-in-law like that. Amen? And uh, the testimony that he had. And uh, this was, I don't know why God laid this particular portion of Scripture, but Ever since that day, there hasn't been a day goes by that I haven't read and thought about and studied John chapter 5. And God dealt with my heart this week, so why don't you just preach from there? Now, I confess to you, there's no way to preach all that's in John chapter 5. I, I think I probably have about 30 outlines right now. Amen. Right? there's so much here. But there is something on which I want to focus this morning. A simple message. But I pray it will be a help and an encouragement to you. I pray it will be an illumination. If you have the Gospel of John chapter 5, I'm going to ask you to honor the reading of God's Word if you're able to please stand. If you're able. John chapter 5, and we're going to begin in verse 16. Read a few verses, take our text, I'll pray, and then have you seated. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. Now, you know what's happened here. Uh, Jesus has come to the pool of Bethesda. And there's a man there that's empty. There's a great multitude of folks, but Jesus seeks out this one man. And of course, you know the story. Jesus heals him, but it was on the Sabbath day. And that was a real problem for the religious folk. Amen? So they come after him, and it says in verse number 16, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. That's a fine thing to do after he healed a man, right? And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Imagine that. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily. He says that many times throughout the Gospels. Very, that means this is very important. To pay close attention to what I'm about to tell you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men, notice how often you see that word all. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Here it is again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. I want to take our text from the last five words in verse 24. Is, but is passed. Passed from death into life. I want to preach on that subject. Passed from death unto life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is pure. Your word is holy. 
The word is food to us. It is nourishment. It is health. It is life. Your word is alive. It is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we know, according to the scriptures, that it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. Lord, there is a thought that goes through our head, even now, that you're not completely aware of what we're thinking. Lord, that alone should motivate us to take heed to your word. For you said that whosoever would hear your word and believe upon him whom God has sent would not come into condemnation, but be passed from death into life. Now, Lord, there may be many here today who have passed from death into life. Their physical bodies are still here. They're breathing. They can see. They can hear. But they've passed from death into life. There may be some here, though, whose bodies are just as alive as the others, but have not yet passed from death into life. For them, I ask today, God, today would be the day they pass from death into life. Through the hearing of your word and believing, Lord Jesus, you can transform every soul by the power of the word of God. Help us, Lord Jesus, today, and may your son be glorified, O God, more than anything else. Move me out of the way, Lord. I have nothing to say to these people that's helpful. And I do not wish to waste their time. So, Lord, you take over. And Holy Spirit, please lift up Jesus Christ, who alone is worthy. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Passed from death unto life. John chapter 5, but very early in Jesus' ministry. As I look at the book of John, I've outlined the book of John. In John chapter 1, we find the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And the Word was made flesh. Amen? God incarnate. Emmanuel, God with us. In John chapter 2, we find the introduction of Christ. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. Now, we're going to deal with this in just a minute. But he was not talking about... The temple uh, uh, that was built that took 46 years to build. He wasn't talking, he was talking about his body. He was making a spiritual reference. He was introducing himself. In John chapter 3, we have the identification of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He not only gave you the zip code, he postmarked it, gave you the return address. We have everything we need to know about the identification of Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. Amen. Amen. In chapter 4, we have the indoctrination of Christ. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I, I shall give him shall never thirst. Now, again, he's not talking about the water that was in that well that you drink and you'll thirst again. He's talking about the water that he is able to give, the water of life. For he is the rock that was smitten. Just read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You want to know where that water came from that Moses smote out there in the desert? And millions got drank from a rock? The Bible says that rock was Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That's what the Bible says. For he is the water of life. And here we come in John chapter 5. We have what I could call the beginning of the inquisition of Christ. And from now through John chapter 19 when he's crucified, that's all the Jews are doing, the religious leaders. In, in, inquisition against Christ. They sought every way to someday gritting their teeth all the way how to kill this man. <clears throat> and all he did was heal folks. Amen. And feed folks with nothing. And give folks drink. And give them the truth. And raise the dead. And make the blind to see again. And for that they sought to kill him. No it wasn't for that. It was the fact that he was equal with God. And may I say to you. That still bothers the world today. The world doesn't mind so much. Baby Jesus in a manger. Christmas time. That does not bother the world so much. What drives the world insane is an empty tomb. That drive because if the tomb is empty, then he is who he said he was. Amen. And he is alive, and you will stand before him, all of us, one day in judgment. Chapter 6, we go into the implementation of Christ. I could go on and on. He is the bread which came down from heaven. The bread which I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world, and so on. And so in John, we have the beginning of this inquisition. Now, this brings up a premise that I know I have preached from this pulpit before, 
But I'm going to repeat it on purpose, not only because it, it is it totally in context with the message, but it bears repeating. And that is the issue that the Pharisees missed so much and that many, I'm afraid many even in our pews today, still miss when they read the scriptures. And that is the difference between the flesh and the spirit. They're different. They're not the same. Amen? Now, I realize that God made us in his image, or as he said, let us make man in our image. He's talking about our, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and these three are one God. <clears throat> now, don't try to figure out God's math. It'll drive you insane. Amen? One plus one plus one equals one with God. Amen? God the Father, God the... And these three are one. One God, three persons. He made us in his image. Body, soul, and spirit. Now, wait just a minute, though. At conception, and by the way, it's not at, it's not at the birthing table. It's at conception. For those of you that like to murder babies, amen? Is this on TV? For those of you that like to murder babies, abortion is a fancy name for murder, by the way. Amen. Just thought, amen. Just thought amen. I'd throw that in there. Murder. But at conception, at conception, God breathes into your nostrils the breath of life, and you become a living. What is this now? Thank you. He's giving me the water of life. If I drink this, will I live forever? You said that's a trick question. I'm not answering that. God breathed into your nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. Now, you clearly have a body, and God develops that body in the womb. Amen? Fearfully and wonderfully made, David said. And you have a soul. And by the way, your soul will live forever. Your soul, it will live forever. It's either going to spend eternity in hell or spend eternity in heaven. And what determines that is on what you do with Jesus Christ today. That's what we're talking about, passing from death into life. So pay close attention. Your soul, from the moment you are conceived and God brings into, brings into your nostrils the breath of life, you become a living soul. And that soul, that's who you are. That's your personality. That's your character. The body represents God the Son in the flesh. The soul represents God the Father, His character, His personality, His truth, His holiness, and the Spirit. And here's where the problem comes. When you and I are born, our body and soul are alive. But you are born spirit dead. You're spirit dead from the day of birth. That's exactly what Paul meant. When he said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, he said, And you hath he quickened, that word quickened means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now you say, Brother Ferris, I look around and I see millions of people. And, and, and people even in the city and the pews of our churches. And they look very much alive. Uh, uh, they see and they can, maybe they're very highly educated. Maybe they're very productive people in life. Uh, 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 maybe they're very giving people. They're good husbands and good wives and good neighbors and good American citizens. But may I say to you, their body and soul are alive, but their spirit is still dead until they pass from death unto life. Amen. There's a transformation that must take place. Listen, there's way too much of this going on in our churches across America. Where it's just, you know, you just pray this prayer and, and just say you believe Jesus and you're saved. Listen to me, the devils believe and tremble. And there's way too much of this just passing Jesus. Listen, I love the name of Jesus. It does something to me, amen? Because I know what he did for me on that cross, amen? There's something about the name of Jesus. It's the name that is above every name. Every knee's going to bow, amen, of things in heaven and things in earth. And every tongue's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God. Listen, I love the name of Jesus, but we believe passing around far too lightly these days. Everything these days, oh, praise Jesus. Got Jesus on our t-shirts. We got. I, I'm not against all that stuff, okay? I'm simply saying, watch how lightly you use that name. That name ought to make your knees shake. That name ought to make your heart flutter, Amen. It shouldn't just be something you cast about casually. It's a holy, wonderful, perfect name. The name of Jesus. All right. I say all that to say this. When you're born, your body and soul are alive. Every man is born. Every woman's born. Your body and soul are very much alive. And you may well go through life, as I said, being a productive person, highly educated, intelligent, and, and can do and perform all kinds of wonderful acts. But unless your spirit is made alive, you will die and spend eternity in hell. 
You must, in this life, pass from death into life. I'm not talking about the flesh. I'm talking about the spirit. You remember Nicodemus had trouble with this? And he was a ruler of the Jews. Was he not? This was an intelligent man, learned in the word of God. And he came to Jesus by night. And Jesus told him he must be born again. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can a man enter his mother's womb the second time? No more than you can crawl back into your mother's womb and be born a second time. Can you save yourself? Amen. There must be a transformation. And you are incapable of making that transformation. Only God can cause that which is dead and make it alive. Amen. Scientists still can't do this with the best scientific rooms and all this so-called artificial intelligence. Science still cannot take nothing and make life out of it. Amen. Amen. God can. Amen. Amen. God can. Now, <clears throat> I want to make sure we drive that premise home because the spirit is dead. Now, in John chapter 9, you may remember, which deals with the illumination of Christ. In John chapter 9, Jesus, Jesus said, For judgment, I am coming to this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. He's not talking about physical eyeballs, learned to discriminate between the flesh and the spirit. They had trouble with this all the way along. When he said, destroy this temple in John chapter 2, and in three days I'll raise it up. He was, he was using a physical illustration to try to teach a spiritual truth. But they didn't get it, did they? Forty and six years were we in building this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? Wasn't talking about that physical building. He was talking about the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, friend, the greatest mistake you can make is to read your Bible and try to fit it into your physical applications. God uses physical illustrations because Jesus said, if I tell you of earthly things that you don't understand, how in the world are you going to understand if I tell you of heavenly things? Amen? And so throughout the scriptures, Jesus, in John chapter 6, Jesus said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this flesh, he shall live forever. The, the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You remember what everybody said? How can we eat this man's flesh? Even his disciples said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And Jesus said, will he also go away? Remember that? Jesus was using a physical illustration to teach a spiritual truth. And that's what we have here in John chapter 5. When he says in verse 24 in our text, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. We're not talking about the soul now. Something has transformed. Something has changed. Your soul is going to live forever the moment you're born. But now you have a spirit that's been made alive and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Can I put it to you simply? On February the 12th, 1984, at about 10 o'clock that Sunday morning, I walked into the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Swansboro, North Carolina. Pastor Steve Wakefield stood in the pulpit. I was very much alive. I was a United States Marine, very much alive, very well trained, amen? But if I would have died at 10 o'clock that morning, I would have spent eternity in hell because my spirit was dead. Oh, but about 1 o'clock that afternoon. <laughs> Pardon me if I have a little, a little bit of fun for just a minute. When I walked into Pastor Wakefield's office, I grabbed his arm in the parking lot and I told him I'm not saved. He said, right there's my office. And I went in there and ball on his couch, big strapping United States Marine, ball on his couch like a baby for about a half an hour. And I got up, amen, and something was changed. Amen. There was a transformation. If you looked at me on the outside, you wouldn't notice the difference. Haircut's about the same, the same ugly mug, amen. Go ahead and say amen, brother. Amen. I, didn't want God. I, didn't want say amen. I can see it. He's just tearing him up. Say amen. 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 You say amen. I'll give you liberty, brother, because I know it's the truth. Hey, listen to me. Didn't look like there was any change on the outside. But listen, at that moment, on 1 o'clock in the afternoon, February 12, 1984, I passed from death unto life. Amen. My body's still alive. So how did you pass from death unto life? Because my soul, which was dead, was quickened and made alive. Why? Because I heard his word. I believed his word. There's therefore now no condemnation. Woo! I'm about to shout amen. All the sins that I committed have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb who shed it on that cross and then took it up to heaven on the third day. Sins are gone. Amen. Praise God. Just like the men who 
gave me liberty. Physically speaking, Jesus Christ gave me liberty, spiritually speaking. Amen. And I passed that day from death unto life. Now, this is one of those messages where the, the, the sermon really is only about six, six, seven minutes. The introduction is about an hour. I'm just kidding. I'll move quickly. Now, I want you to notice quickly, and I don't have time to get into this. I wish I could preach this message if I wanted to, but I do need to touch on it just so you see what's going on here. But Jesus touches on several resurrections here, several of them. And I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but maybe I'll let you whistle to study a little bit. In verse 24 and 25, we see the resurrection that I'm talking about now, passing from death into life. That's when the lost sinner passes from death into life. That's a resurrection. Look at verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come to condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's what resurrection is, by the way. It's passing from death unto life. Now, verily, verily, I say unto you, verse 25, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Amen? Amen. Amen. Those are the lost sinners. Tom Greaver's in the grave now, my father-in-law. But one of these days, they're going to hear, he's going to hear his voice. And it says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. So I have to believe at least for a moment we're going to get to see some of this. I, I can't picture in my mind, Miss Marianne, what this is going to look like. But it's got to be wonderful. I mean, I can say, I, I just see standing by my wife here saying, look, you're going with your dad. What's he doing up there? <laughs> dead in Christ are going to hear his voice and that's the resurrection of those that are dead in Christ those that somewhere in their life spiritually speaking passed from death unto life are going to experience that resurre resurrection then there's another resurrection mentioned here and that's the dead in Christ raised to life verse 28 and 29 marvel not at this for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good in the resurrection of life. Now stop there for just a minute. As we said in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we get a perfect picture of this. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus shall God bring with him. And then he goes on to say, For this I say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. And the thing you can do about it, the graves of those who are dead in Christ, who passed from death into life while their body was still living, they're going to come up out of the grave. Amen. Amen. Then there's another resurrection here. You don't want to be a part of this resurrection. It's the resurrection of the condemned unto judgment. And you'll find that in the end of verse 29. Unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. And you find the great white throne judgment. Amen. So he speaks of several resurrections here. Now, here's the question. If the body and soul are still alive, then how can the spirit be made alive? You and I are incapable of doing that on our own. That's not an act you can perform. Praying to a statue won't do it. Giving all the money in your purse to the church won't do it. Joining churches and getting baptized won't do it. So how can this transformation take place? How do we pass from death unto life, spiritually speaking, while our body's still living? Because if you take your last breath and you didn't pass from death unto life spiritually, you never will. Did you hear what I said? You'll spend eternity in hell in a place not even prepared for you. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. If you go to hell, you go there as an intruder. God did not design that for you. That's why he sent his son on the cross. So that you and I, spiritually speaking, could pass from death unto life. Now, I want you to watch this. The world, and you wonder why all the madness is going on. Basically, you're just seeing the world acting out what's in their heart. You know I can tell what's in a man's heart by the way he talks? You got a verse for that hot shot? Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. I talked to a young man yesterday that just turned 20 years old. He's already had two children out of wedlock. He and his wife didn't want to have a job. He was complaining to me about being broke. Talking to me about what a hard worker he was while he lives rent free in his grandma's house and won't even take the time to cut her grass. 
I wanted to rearrange this guy's license plate for a minute. Amen. Amen. God said, wait a minute, there's a soul there. So we tried to deal with that. And he was a representation of many that we deal with in our military today. No different than what you deal with right here in Salem, West Virginia, and wherever you live. Millions groping in darkness. Mm -hmm. Just like the impotent man in John chapter 5. If you go back to the first part of John chapter 5, it says when Jesus came, and Jesus didn't do anything by accident. Up until now, his ministry's been somewhat private. I mean, he, he did turn the water into wine at the marriage in Cana. Uh, he did run the money changers out in the temple. Uh, uh, you know, he had that private meeting with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and chapter 4. It's the woman at the well. But for the most part, his, 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 mess, his ministry has been rather private. Now he's going public. He goes to the pool of Bethesda. And it says there's a great, now think about this because this is going to be the rest of the message. It says there's a great multitude of impotent folk there. That word impotent simply means that they really don't have the ability, whether it's because of disease or by accident or by nature, birth defect, whatever it may be, they do not have the ability to perform just about anything. And in those days, they didn't have rehab centers and all the facilities and things that we have today. You were pretty much the refuse. You were cast out. That's why you find so many people by the roadside, blind men begging. There was nothing for them to do. So they went to this pool of Bethesda, and you know the story, they waited for the troubling of the waters. And the Bible says for 38 years, we're going to look at this in just a minute, because I want you to see it. For 38 years, this man came waiting for something to happen. <clears throat> I talked to God's people, I'm going to say, they claim to be Christians, all over America, every week at a different church. In our military bases, military men and women, all over the world, all over America. <clears throat> And you know what I see? I see people that are waiting for something to happen. Just waiting. Just wondering. What if we could just get the right man in the White House, Brother Paris, so that we can straighten this thing out? Now listen, I'm all for voting. I'm all, we'll do a civic lesson another time, amen? I'm, I'm all for our civic duty to vote and all those things. But God's not waiting for us to get right in the White House. He's waiting for things to get right in the church house. Amen. Amen. Check your scriptures. That's where revival comes from. It starts here. Judgment begins in the house of God, the Bible says. Amen. We get it right in here. The world's not going to get it right. No. Nope. They need to see us passing from death unto life. And don't you know, when Jesus said in John chapter 11, and I love what it said, it said, loose him and let him go. Because <laughs> you imagine... What would Lazarus do after he'd been raised from the dead, sitting there stinking after four days, and they loosed him? Oh, well, that was kind of nice. Yeah, I, was, I was dead. Now I'm alive. What's for supper? I don't think he had that kind of careless attitude. I think he was in shock. I think he was astonished, as all the people were. I think he was amazed. But man, I was dead. They just took grave clothes off of me. How am I alive? How am I physically passed from death unto life? I'll tell you how. Because the original, I'm talking about life. The original was there. Amen. And when the original was present, dead can't stay dead in the presence of Jesus. That's why he never preached the funeral. Amen. And I don't recommend you go into mortuary work in heaven. I hear business is terrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were impotent. Without strength. Now I want you to see a comparison real quick and then we'll finish the message. Go with me in Deuteronomy chapter 2. Hold your finger in John 5 because I'm coming right back. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Jesus doesn't do anything by accident. You say, how is it that with a multitude of people, a great multitude, the Bible says. Now, I don't know how many that is. But can I just say, that's a whole lot of folk. I don't know what a great multitude means, but I think it's more than two or three. Doesn't matter what the number is to me. He says there's a great multitude. And Jesus seeks out this one man. It's the only man he talked to, according to the scripture, that I can find. And he said, Wilt thou be made whole? It's the only guy I talked to. Why seek him out? Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 2. The Israel have been wandering in the wilderness. The first two years they did all right, and then they came to Kadesh Barnea. And you know what happened? 
they decided they didn't want God's plan of salvation. And they spent the next 38 years wandering in the desert, groping, looking for answers. And Moses is reminding them of it. Look at chapter 2. We're going to look at a couple of verses just for context. Look at verse 1. Moses is reminding them of what they did. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me. And we compassed Mount Seir many days. This is right after they rejected God at Kadesh Barney. Go down to verse 8. And when we passed by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain of Elah, and from Ezion Geber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Now go down with me to verse number 13. Now rise up, said I, and get you over the brook Zared. And we went over the brook Zared, and the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zared was 30 and 8 years. Did you notice that? Until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host, as the Lord swear to them. Now go to John 5. I'll show you one of the reasons. And I wanted to preach more on this, but God would not give living to But this is just one of the reasons why God singled this man out. And I want you to look at it. John chapter 5. And go with me down to, uh, well, let's go down to verse number 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity in how many years? 38 years. Just like, and, and, and go, go back with me to verse 3. Talking about the pool of this, and these lay a great multitude of infinite, infinite folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Go down to verse 6. When Jesus saw this man that had been waiting for 38 years, saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And I want you to notice, if it had been me, and Jesus comes along and says, Wilt thou be made whole? And I've been waiting 38 years. I just say, Yes! Woo! It's today today! It's not what he said. Just like the children of Israel, and just like a lot of folk today, the infinite man answered and said, Sir, I have no man when the water's troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, Another step down before me. And we make all kinds of excuses as to why we wait and put off passing from death into life. I have family members to this day, and it keeps me awake at night. I'm talking about people that I grew up with and love who are not saved. They know they're not saved. And they'll look me in the eye and make some lame excuse like, well, Mike, I just, I just think something like that's pretty serious and it's a private thing. And I just think... You know, God's got to give you the right time when you're ready. That's the devil's lie. Amen. You'll wait yourself into oblivion. Yep. Just ask the infinite folk in the pool of Bethesda. Jesus sought him out because just like the children of Israel were wandering and groping and looking for answers, and just like this man wandered for 38 years, Using the excuse, there's nobody to help me. There's nobody to solve my problem. I need the government to pay for my health care. Everything's got to be free today. Free health care and free education and, and free parking and free love. And everything's got to be free. Amen? And may I say to you, young people, you better watch that free thing. Amen. That bait's got a hook in it. Amen. 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 You better watch that. You better, you better watch that free thing. The only thing that's free is eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ Amen. our Lord. That's Amen. the only thing free worth having. Amen? Amen? But may I say to you, being passed from death unto life, we have a world right here in Salem, West Virginia, in our military, and all over the world. The reason they're building, burning down our buildings and killing one another in the streets and, and ambushing state troopers right here in West Virginia Amen. as the other night. The reason this chaos is going on is we've got a world searching and wandering for answers. They're about to get him. Amen. Because the Antichrist is about to show up on the scene here just after the church is raptured out of here. Yep. And he's going to have all your answers. Amen. He's going to take care of all your business mm -hmm. and take you right to hell with it. You listen to me, church? If I was you, I'd get passed from death unto life now <coughs> while you have the chance. Amen. Now, how does it happen? Very simple. I told you the message in just a few minutes, and I'm sticking to my word. How do we pass from death unto life? He gives it to us right here in verse 24. 
Point number one, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word. Amen. What does the Bible say in Romans 10? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. That's pretty plain, isn't it? The reason is, folks, is because the word of God was <coughs> breathed by the same Holy Spirit that breathed life into you and I. When you pass from death into life, an amazing thing happens. The Holy Spirit of God moves inside of you. And now, unlike the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon men, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. Amen. You pass from death into life. You with me? Amen. Listen, I'm not saying you have to remember the exact minute, day, and hour, and everything else you were saved like I do. But I am saved. You ought to have a very good memory of that moment when all of your sins were washed away and the fetters fell off and you were born again and transformed, passed from death into life. There ought to be some recall. You listen to me, church? And it bothers me that some folks have to dig down deep and say, well, I, I think I made a profession of faith sometime. Forget your profession of faith. When were you born again? Believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know it's impossible to be saved without the word of God. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Peter, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by what? Give me the word. By what? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's impossible to be saved without the word of God. Because the, only the word of God has the power to save. Look with John chapter 6 real quick. I just, it's one, 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 one page over here. John 6. I want you to look at this. Spirit of the flesh. Look at verse 63. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It is verse 63. Jesus speaking after he gave that declaration about him being the bread of life. It is the Spirit, Jesus said, that quickeneth. That word quicken means make alive. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth how much? Nothing. It's nothing you can do to pass from death unto life. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. And the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. You want to pass from death unto life? First thing you must do is hear the word of God. You know what you're supporting this missionary to do? Go to our military and not tell them stories. Not try to see how funny we can be. And not try to figure out whether they're psychologically left brain, light right brain, a positive blood type. It's give them the word of God. You know what Paul did in Acts chapter 16? When the Roman centurion went to commit suicide. Suicide is such a problem today and it is. And Paul ran to him. If it had been me, I'd been getting out of that joint. Amen? Paul runs to this guy. Do thyself no harm. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He said, well, first you need to understand the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. No, Paul didn't say that. The Bible says he preached unto him and his house the word of God. Amen. Check me out in Acts chapter 16. Preached unto him, the Roman centurion. Then you know what you find? Just a couple of verses. Later. Check me out. Just a couple of verses later, the Roman centurion is wiping the wounds off Paul's back, has him in his house, feeding him, and him and all his house were saved. Why? Because all his house heard the word of God. First thing to passing from death into life is hearing the word of God. Number two is believing the word of God. Believing the word of God. Look what he says. He says right there. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. May I say to you, it is impossible to be saved without believing the word of God. You believe by faith, not by sight. Romans chapter 8 says, for if a man uh, uh, gets, uh, were saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why did he yet hope for? We believe by faith. We see this representation, but you and I have never seen Jesus Christ. We weren't there at the cross. We weren't there when he was born. We weren't there when he rose again. We've never seen Jesus Christ. You believe by faith. And may I say to you, hearing the word of God is the first step, but it's impossible to be saved and pass from death unto life without believing the word. It's impossible. Galatians 3.22 says, for the scriptures are written, all of the scriptures are written. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. John chapter 1. And to them that received him, to them gave he power to be the sons of God, 
even the, them that believed on his name. Jesus said, you go first. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever what? Believeth in him, believeth. It's impossible to be saved without believing. Impossible. If you're going to pass from death unto life, you have to hear the word of God, because only the word of God can take that which is dead and make it alive again. It's the spirit that quickens. You must believe the word of God. And then lastly, there's the transformation by the word of God. Look at verse 24. Passed from death unto life. Hath not had the everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's a transformation. How can a man be born when he's old? How can he be born again? That's something only God can do. He proved to us when he rose again the third day. He's the only one, by the way, who's ever done that bodily. Rose again the third day. And that's why Jesus said to Mary and Martha in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He's not talking about the body. Too many graves to prove to us that the body is still going to die and flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking about the spirit being made alive. Passed from death unto life. Transformed. It's nothing you see with your eyes, but it's something you know in your heart. You know why I get excited when we sing the songs of Zion like we sung this morning? Wash me whiter than snow, because he did. Because he did. And the Holy Spirit lives in me. Somebody asked me one time, said, so why do you shout the way you do? I'm not blaming on the Holy Spirit because it's his fault. It's like he's got a hold of my heart, and every once in a while he just squeezes, and I go, ah! <laughs> Amen! Can't help it. It's what happens when you pass from death unto life. Amen. Your spirit is made alive. I go into some churches, and my wife will tell you this, and we get out of there, and we wondered if anybody in there had a pulse. And I'm not talking about physically. I could see that they were breathing. But there wasn't enough Holy Spirit there to fill a fiddle. You with me, church? Amen. And them churches are all, I'm glad I don't see that here. But there are a lot of churches like that in America. And my wife went out there and said, let's just go to lunch. Because maybe that'll be better than what we had this morning. Amen. You listen to me? Amen. Past from death unto life. On May the 19th, we buried my father in law, Tom Greer. On May the 16th, early Tuesday morning, about 12 20 in the morning, my wife, my youngest daughter Abigail, his wife Shirley, we were all gathered around and watched him about 12 20, Tuesday morning, May 16th. Take his last breath. But in 1977, he had already passed from death into life. Amen. One of the preaching of a man named Gene McClung in Enterprise, West Virginia. He heard the word of God, believed the word of God, and was passed from death into life. Amen. His spirit was made alive. And so we went to the casket holding the life, the hand of my grieving wife. We looked at the casket and we did not mourn as those that have no hope. I just simply looked in there and I said, Dad, let's say goodbye. It's just good night. I'll see you in the morning. Because he's passed from death unto life just like I was. Hearing the word of God, believing the word of God, and being transformed does the world know you're transformed this morning? I know I'm looking at a lot of people in here who would tell me, Brother Mike, I, I know I'm passing from death into life. And praise God for that. Does the world know? The world, obviously, they're dying for it. We're killing state troopers for it. They're dying to see some evidence that God is who he said he is. And do you know God's method of doing that? The local New Testament church. Two questions are done. One, if you are passed from death into life, what are you doing to share that with others? What are you doing to make sure that your neighbors, your friends, everybody with whom you come in contact has the opportunity to hear and believe so they can pass from death into life? The other question is this. Would there be somebody with courage enough in here? By the way, 
I'm sitting in your shoes because I was in the pew. I had grown up in church. You know my testimony, church. I grew up in church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Could quote you the Romans road. I could quote you the verses. Physically alive, intellectually smart, spiritually dead. Until that day on February 12, 1984, when I heard, believed, and the Holy Spirit were dead. Listen, church. The devil nearly used pride to send me to hell. I was so proud I couldn't go forward during the invitation. I had to wait until everybody left and grab the preacher's arm and tell them I'm lost. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Pride almost sent this boy to hell. I'm wondering if there's somebody in this room with the courage today. Say, Brother Mike, I've been in church a long time. But I've yet to pass from death to life. Body's alive. I know scripture. So is the devil, by the way. He tried quoting it to Jesus. Oh, he did. He misquoted it, though, didn't he, Brother Shirley? Dirty, filthy liar. Just ask Eve. He quoted scripture to her. Changed the words just enough that she bit. You listen to him? Maybe there's somebody in this room who would have the courage to say, Brother Mike, I'm living and breathing physically. I've been in church. I've read the Bible. I've given money. But I've not yet passed from death into life. Would you have the courage to make the day to day? And just like the infinite man who waited 38 years, get up out of this room and walk, spiritually speaking, for the first time. Heavenly Father, how I love your word. I love Lighthouse Baptist Church, and they love me. They love my head. Lord, I am impressed this morning that someone here needs to pass from death into life. Holy Spirit, you're longing and waiting to save the lost soul. Lord, there are many in this room I know that have already heard your word and believed and trusted Christ fully to save them from their sin. They've been born again. They have passed from death into life. Lord, you're going to hold somebody's heart here today to cause them for the first time to walk out of here saying, I need to tell others. I need to quit living for myself and wandering for the things of this world. Or to start hoping to get others to pass from death into life before it's eternally too late for them. Please help us, Lord, and thank you for what you're about to do in this short time of invitation. In Christ's name. Amen. Stand your feet, please, with your heads bowed and eyes closed and be in his place. You come. I don't believe in long invitations. If God's dealt with your heart, you need to move. I wonder if there's someone who would say, Brother Ferris, I have, I've never passed from death unto life. Physically, I know I'm alive. I feel like I'm a productive person. But there's never been a time never been a time when I can say I heard the word of God and believed him only for salvation and the Holy Spirit moved in and I passed from death unto life. Would there be anyone with the courage in this room? Don't let pride be the reason you spend eternity in hell. Who knows about it? The people in this room will mean nothing to you when you face Jesus Christ and the judgment alone. For it is appointed unto man once to die, talking about the body, after this judgment. 